Alright, so hey guys, um, like Ben said, my name is Aaron, and I had the privilege of going first this time. Um, <laughs> the last semester I got to go last, which was much better. Um, so obviously I'm doing Islam. Um, I chose Islam because in high school, um, in my global studies class, we did a religion unit, and I got to go visit a mosque, and I thought it was super cool. I didn't know much about it. But I, th I mean, obviously, I thought it was really pretty. All the mosques are elaborate. You guys will see a few pictures here shortly. But it piqued my interest a little bit in high school. And then in college this year, I'm doing uh, my internship on medical missions. And last semester, I took the perspectives course, and we learned about um, the, four, or the 1040 window um, in Asia, the Middle East area, just that um, strip of countries within latitude 10 and 40, um, which are unreached. and one of the major religions in that area is Islam. And then also with my internship, I met with Dr. Hoskins, who's an ER doctor, and he spends a lot of time overseas in the Middle East, um, just working with Muslims and ministering to them um, as a Christian, and it also piqued my interest. And so this semester, I was like, I'm going to do my presentation on Islam. So, is this going to work? Nice. Um, I'm sure you guys all have heard of the name Abraham at some point. So, in Christianity and Judaism, um, Abraham, that's not the laser pointer, Abraham, um, in the Bible, marries Sarah, and then they have a son named Isaac. And so, Christianity and Judaism stems from Isaac and Isaac's offspring, um, specifically Jacob. Whereas in Islam, the other Abrahamic religion, they look at um, Ishmael, which was Abraham's son with his servant Hagar, because initially Sarah was unable to conceive and give birth, and so she suggested to Abraham that um, she or that Abraham has his offspring through her servant, and so then Abraham had Ishmael, who's Isaac's um, older brother, and then um, Muslims look at Ishmael for the lineage of um, people, descendants through Ishmael. That's um, God raised up nations through, and then eventually the prophets came um, to that lineage and ended with Muhammad in like 700, 600 AD. Um, but uh, anyway, Islam is looking at Ishmael, whereas the other Abrahamic religions look at Isaac. So the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac in the Bible um, is taken, and in Islam they believe that Abraham went to sacrifice Ishmael instead. Although the Quran never specifically says which son Abraham went to sacrifice, they believe it was Ishmael for a number of reasons. Um, so when Abraham was, uh, when he received the command from Allah, who um, is God in Islam, they just call God Allah. Allah. That was the worst voice crack ever. <laughs> um, he, I lost my train of thought. Um, Abraham received the command from Allah to sacrifice his son Ishmael, and Abraham and Hagar and Ishmael were confronted by the devil, and he tried to persuade them all not to let Abraham follow through with that command. Um, but all three resisted and said that Abraham should listen to Allah's commands, even if it was at the expense of his son's life. And then eventually Abraham confronted Ishmael himself, and Ishmael um, again encouraged Abraham to sacrifice him, even though um, he was going to die. He said it was better to listen to Allah's will than... Um, to not do that and spare Ishmael's life. Um, and so when Abraham went to strike his son Ishmael down, either, they don't know which one it was, there's two kind of legends, either the, the knife was flipped upside down in Abraham's hand and he just hit him with the, hit the handle of the knife and didn't actually kill him, or a plate of copper appeared over Isaac's chest and prevented Abraham from killing his son. Um, but they believe that Ishmael is a prominent example of surrendering your own will to that of Allah's because even though Ishmael knew he was going to die, he was tempted by the devil and then confronted by Abraham, he still said that Abraham should um, sacrifice himself, Ishmael, um, so that he would follow Allah's will and not his own or um, Ishmael's will. And then so after that, um, more history with Ishmael, Abraham received another command from Allah to take his son Ishmael and Hagar to Mecca at the time, and so he did, um, and left them there, and then returned back to his homeland. But then several years later, he returned back to Mecca um, to build the Kaaba, which he was instructed to do by Allah, um, which is how Mecca 
um, or one of the reasons why Mecca became um, the holy city in Islam is because the Kaaba is there, which I'll expand on in a little bit, what that is and what that symbolizes in their faith. Um, and so when he left after building the Kaaba, um, they don't know if Ishmael helped in that construction. Some, some legends say that he did, some say that he didn't, but um, whether or not he participated is inconsequential um, to their faith. And so when Abraham left after building the Kaaba, um, Hagar and Ishmael were still there, but they ran out of water. And so Hagar traveled between the hills of Al Safa and Al Marwa, which, side note, there are many words and names in this presentation that I don't know if I'm pronouncing correctly. Um, these are two of them. But anyway, Hagar traveled between those two hills in search of water for herself and her son, um, but did not find any. And when she returned, she found her son Ishmael with an angel, angel, and the angel was scratching the ground. Um, some say it was with his finger, some say it was with Ishmael's heel. Um, again, they don't know which one it was, there's just different legends to go along with the story. Um, but where he was scratching the ground turned into a spring called the Zamzam Spring, or the Zamzam Spring. Um, which then brought forth water for Hagar and her son Ishmael. And then the spring lasted. Um, it didn't just dry up overnight. It lasted um, and is still there today. And eventually birds began to circle. And a passing tribe known as the Jerham tribe saw the birds and they knew that there wasn't any water or life over there. And so they went to investigate and they saw the well. They saw that Hagar and Ishmael were living there near the, the Kaaba in Mecca. And they asked Hagar's permission to settle with them. And so Hagar let them settle, and that's how the city of Mecca was started, not just the, the small town, but the city of Mecca, um, with the, the Jerham tribe. Um, and then Hagar let the tribe um, help raise her son. Um, they, she let them help her teach Ishmael valuable life skills and life lessons, um, and just helped him mature throughout the rest of his adolescence. And then... Um, like I said, there are many prophets in Islam. There's 25 to be exact, 25 known prophets. There may be many more, but 25 specific prophets that are known. These are just some of them. Um, and many of them are also major biblical figures. As you can see, I'm not going to read all the names, but most of those, all those names actually are in the Bible. Um, and the last three prophets are John the Baptist, Jesus, who they call Isa, and then Muhammad himself. Um, but there are 25 prophets in total, and um, looking at the prophecies of each one and the lives of each one, um, Muslims are able to um, put truths together that they hold um, in their faith, which I talk about in my paper. If you guys want to read that, if you're interested, feel free. Um, I'm just not going to go into that detail right now. But essentially, um, Muhammad was the last prophet, and um, during his life, he was meditating in a cave in 610. AD when he was visited by the angel Gabriel and he received revelation from Allah himself um, through Gabriel about who Allah was, who God was, and he instructed Muhammad to then preach on or preach about Allah, telling um, the world who he was and that they should worship only Allah himself, no other gods or idols. Um, and so Muhammad did that. And then when Muhammad died, um, leaders known as caliphs took his, his place. And there's a little bit of nepotism going on because the first four caliphs were either father, fathers-in-law or sons-in-law of Muhammad. Um, he had 11 wives, most of which were at the same time, which they teach against having, or they, they only allow up to four wives in some countries today. Um, but ultimately, they're supposed to follow the law of the land, which is why you don't see um, Muslims here in the U.S. with more than one wife. But that's a side note. Um, he had 11 wives and therefore 11 fathers-in-law, and two of them became um, Abu Bakr and Umar, were his fathers, two of his fathers-in-law, and then Uthman and Ali um, preceded the previous two um, caliphs, and those were his two of his sons-in-law. And during the reign of those first four caliphs, um, Muslims conquered a lot of area in Syria, Palestine, Iran, and Iraq, um, just kind of where um, Islam exploded in that region back in the day. And uh, eventually the caliphate system um, turned into the Ottoman Empire in, I think it's 1517. And then the Ottoman Empire lasted until World War I in 1917 when it was disbanded, and that was also the end of the caliphate system. And then moving on towards more modern Islam, there are two major denominations today. 
Um, this is one of the few slides I have that doesn't have pictures. I apologize. Um, but two of the major denominations today in Islam are Sunni and Shia. Sunnis compose roughly 80% of Muslims worldwide, Shia being around 15, and then there's various other denominations, um, some of which I mentioned in my paper, that make up the other 5%. But um, Sunnis you can find all over the world, whereas Shias, I mean, you can find both all over the world, but Shias are predominantly in Iran, Iraq, and Syria today, um, whereas most Muslims you meet outside of that region will be Sunni. Um, obviously, there's exceptions. But the major difference between the two is that Sunni Muslims accept the first four caliphs as legitimate, whereas Shia only accept Caliph Ali, who was, I believe, the fourth, um, yeah, the fourth caliph in that line, who was one of Muhammad's sons-in-law. They accept him as the first real caliph um, and his offspring as the, the leaders after him, um, whereas Sunnis accept the first four as legitimate. And then also Sunnis accept um, six books of Hadith, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well, what that is exactly, um, whereas Shia accepts only four books of Hadith. Um, and then when the Ottoman Empire disbanded and the caliphate system ended, um, the major leaders in Islam, um, in the Sunni denomination, um, didn't have as prominent a role. They have imams today, I think I'm pronouncing that right, imams, um, who organize prayer sessions within the mosques, um, which you'll see pictures of where they kind of sit in the mosque um, in a little bit, but they also have a role in interpreting sh uh, Sharia law today, which I'll, or I'll talk about in a little bit, what Sharia law is. Um, whereas Shia Muslims have a more where they have more of a hierarchy in terms of leadership structure with grand ayatollahs at the top who also have a role in um, interpreting Sharia law. Um, and the difference between these two is that Sunnis believe that Imams are um, fallible, meaning they can sin, whereas uh, Shia Muslims believe that grand ayatollahs are infallible and divinely inspired to interpret Sharia law. Um, another difference and how they practice their faith today is that Sunni Muslims, um, well, all Muslims pray five times a day. It's one of the pillars that I'll mention here in a few slides, but Sunnis will pray five times a day um, with breaks between the prayers. So morning, noon, afternoon, dusk, nighttime, essentially. Um, whereas Shia Muslims will also pray five times, but they pray in a one, two, two pattern, meaning they can combine some of the prayers together so they're not praying five different occasions. They're doing five prayers, but it's on three different occasions instead, just to make their lives a little bit easier. Um, moving on. So the five pillars of Islam. The first one is, I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of these right, but Sha'a'ara, -ah, Sha I think, which is also known as the Creed, which is simply to just declare one's faith in Allah and your belief in Muhammad as the final prophet and the one that received revelations from Allah through the angel Gabriel. The second pillar is Salat, which is just the commitment to pray five times a day, whether that's in a one, two, two pattern or um, five separate times throughout the day. The third pillar is Psalm, which is just the commitment to fast during the month of Ramadan, when that rolls around, which again, I'll talk about coming up here. And then the fourth pillar is the Hajj, which is um, the, the pilgrimage you make once, at least once in your lifetime as a Muslim to Mecca to go through a series of rituals um, surrounding the Kaaba and just the land that Abraham and Ishmael grew up in and lived in back in the day. And then the fifth pillar is zakat, which is just almsgiving or showing generosity by giving um, time, money, resources to those that are less fortunate than you. So more specifically, the Hajj um, in all of its details, there's different um, sites that I looked at that had these in, diff in a different order. Um, walking counterclockwise around the Kaaba seven times was always first. But, and the final walk around the Kaaba was always last, um, but the others were in different orders. So I don't know if there's a specific order, but these are the, the parts of the Hajj that you go through. And this year the Hajj is taking place in July, um, July 17th to the 22nd. But um, the steps are, you get there and you walk counterclockwise around the Kaaba seven times. Um, and I mentioned the Kaaba before, Abraham constructed it in Mecca um, when he was instructed to go back there by Allah. And essentially what it is, is it's the holiest place on earth um, in the eyes of Muslims. And there were some sites that I saw, they, they believe it's God's dwelling place here on earth. And so whenever they pray, they face the Kaaba. Um, wherever they are in the world, um, in mosques, there's a shrine that indicates the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia. 
and they face the Kaaba whenever they pray. So the first first step of the Hajj is walking around the Kaaba seven times in a counterclockwise manner. Um, another piece of the Hajj is trotting between the hills of Al Safa and Al Marwa, which, if you guys remember, are the hills that Hagar walked between to find water for Ishmael and herself when they ran out after Abraham constructed the Kaaba. They also drink from the Zamzam well, which is the well that um, sprung up when the angel was scratching the ground while Hagar was walking between the hills. They also stand in vigil in the plains of Mount Arafat, which essentially is they just pray for um, the entire day um, in the plains of Mount Arafat. And Mount Arafat is where Muhammad preached his last sermon when he was here on earth, which is the significance behind that mountain. Um, and the plain is just right near the mountain. They also spend a night in the plain of Muzdalifa. Um, and Muzdalifa is also where they symbolically stone the devil, which is um, set up as three pillars there. Um, and the pillars represent the times that Satan tried to tempt Abraham, Hagar, and Ishmael to prevent Abraham from sacrificing his son Ishmael. Um, and they symbolically stone those as part of the Hajj as well. And then afterwards, they do one final walk around the Kaaba in a counterclockwise fashion, and then men shave their, head, their heads and women trim the ends of their hair afterwards. And then after that, the Hajj is said to be complete, and you're only supposed to do it one time in your life, but you can do it, I believe, more than once if you want to, um, but it's required that you do it at least once if you're physically able to do so um, as a Muslim. So, the holy texts in Islam are the Quran and the Hadith. The Quran is the holiest book. Um, it's composed of 114 chapters, um, written just after, it might have been during the latter half of Abraham, not Abraham's, Muhammad's life, um, and to continue thereafter. Um, but Muhammad himself could not write, and so he had scribes that wrote the Quran for him. Um, but it's Allah speaking in first person through the angel Gabriel. Um, beginning when Allah, not Allah, um, Muhammad received his first revelation from Allah in the cave that he was meditating in, in 610 AD, and then he continued to receive revelations throughout the rest of his life. Um, and translations of the Quran, it's written in Arabic, but translations are said to not be a true interpretation and should not be looked at as legitimate, um, and so they're essentially taken as a grain of salt. You can use them for reference to understand more what you're saying, but the true Quran um, and the words of Allah are only spoken and written in Arabic um, to get their full meaning. And then the Hadith is all of the additional words, actions, and silent approvals Muhammad gave during his lifetime in reference to Sharia law and the Quran, which were just written down in volumes upon volumes of um, scrolls at the time, which are now books. And so the Hadith, um, if you guys remember, between Sunni and Shia, um, Sunnis accept six books of Hadith, whereas Shia only accepts four. And um, the Hadith is second highest in importance um, in terms of the two holy texts, uh, the Quran being first and the Hadith being second. Um, and not all Muslims view the Hadith as divinely inspired because they were written years and generations after Muhammad's death. And so I don't know how exactly they're able to um, preserve all of his, his words and actions and silent approvals. Um, during his life if they didn't write them down right away, but they were able to do so and are now um, the books of Hadith in Islam. So Sharia law and Jihad, Sharia law, excuse me, is just known as the human endeavor to interpret and apply Sharia law correctly. Um, and it stems predominantly from the Hadith because the Quran is relatively short in comparison. And so, um, like I said, the Imams and the leaders of the uh, Shia denomination in Muslim, I forget the name, um, or I'm not gonna try to pronounce the name because I'd probably butcher it, but those two leaders have roles in interpreting Sharia law from the Hadith and from the Quran. Um, and Sharia law is intended to draw humanity closer to Allah and to allow humanity, Muslims, to live in harmony with his creation. And jihad is known as the struggle to conform your life to that of Allah's will. Um, and it comes in any form of struggle you may face in attempting to do so. So that could be um, personal, like sinful temptations that you face, or it could be 
political and cultural obstacles to conforming your life to Allah's will, um, and sometimes even warfare. Usually it's only defensive warfare that they turn to, um, trying to live out Sharia law, but um, I'm sure we all know that there are some sects of um, Islam that are very extreme in their interpretation, and they take an offensive approach to um, jihadic warfare. Um, so you find groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda that will um, commit terrorist attacks on um, certain populations or certain countries um, in order to live out their faith um, in a way that they see fit. Um, but most Muslims denounce that form of practicing Islam. They um, do not agree with that interpretation and that lifestyle, but there are um, smaller denominations that take that approach and live that life. So Islamic worship today, like I said, is done in mosques around the world. Um, and the picture on the left here is, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name, but it's known as the Great Mosque, which is in Mecca, which is where the Kaaba is located in Saudi Arabia. And then the mosque on the right is just a pretty one that I found online, honestly. But it's <laughs> there to show you that mosques are generally elaborate buildings um, with intricate details to illustrate that Allah is superior to all humanity. Um, it's supposed to just be a representation of um, who he is and how he's um, more elaborate and more, um, or he's more beautiful than hum humans could ever be. And within the mosques, there is a mirab, um, which is the little niche that I mentioned, um, which is placed in a position um, within the, the larger room or the courtyard where Muslims pray, um, and it's faced in, or it's placed in the direction of Mecca. Um, specifically the Kaaba, which is where Muslims face when they pray. And there's also a uh, minaret, which is these taller like, buildings, which is where the Imams um, preside over the prayer sessions in Islam. And it's also common to have a place for washing before prayer. So you, you clean yourself, you purify yourself before you go in to pray um, in Islam. And so the prayer itself, um, is it's one of the five pillars of Islam, and men and women pray separately. Um, that's mainly to um, prevent there being any sexual temptation that may happen, because um, when they, they bow down, um, their faces to the ground, and sexual temptation may arise. And so to avoid anything that may come up, they separate men and women, um, either by a curtain, or they have different rooms, or they encourage women to stay home, um, just because um, when months of childbearing or pregnancy come, um, or if the, the husband in the household works and there's only one car, it's harder for her to get to and from the mosque five times a day. And so if the, the wife or the woman wants to stay home and pray, that's totally acceptable. Um, but nonetheless, men and women are separated during worship um, and time of prayer to prevent that sexual temptation from arising. Um, and so when they pray, they, like I said, they bow down in, direction, in the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca to pray, and they touch their forehead and their nose to the ground and when they do that, they say, glory be to God, the most great, three times. Um, and then there's other aspects of their prayer as well, but um, I think oftentimes when we see Muslims pray, we think of that um, image of them bowing down um, and putting their face on the ground and then reciting that sentence, glory be to God, the most great, three different times. So, like other religions, um, Muslims celebrate various holidays throughout the year, and they have their own lunar calendar, which is based on um, when Muhammad traveled from Medina to Mecca. And so Ramadan, which is the, the month of fasting, which actually starts in 2021, it starts tomorrow on, on April 12th. Um, and it's to, um, it's in remembrance of Muhammad receiving his first revelation from Allah, as well as to teach self-discipline, self-control, sacrifice, and empathy for people that are less fortunate. And so they fast during the day, um, sunrise to sunset, and then they're able to eat during the dark hours of the day, um, meaning when the sun is set. And then another holiday is Eid al-Fitur, Fitur, which is the end of Ramadan, which this year is May 13th, um, which is just the end of that month. And Ramadan is celebrated from one crescent moon to another, or to the next. Um, and this year just happens to be April 12th to May 13th. And then another holiday that they celebrate is Yid al-Adha, which this year is on July 20th, which commemorates Abraham's obedience in sacrificing Ishmael, even though he was tempted by Satan 
um, to not do it, and then he confronted Ishmael to see um, just what Ishmael's thoughts were. Um, but he still was willing to sacrifice his son um, for Allah's sake to put Allah's will above his own. Um, and then another holiday, which is the Islamic New Year, is Al Hijra, which is celebrated on August 9th this year, 2021. Um, it's a Ramadan, it's the ninth month in the year. And like I said, it's a lunar calendar, and so it's 365 days, like, a, like our normal calendar. Um, but it's, it's just a different layout. It starts and ends in August. And so today, um, Islam is primarily in the, the Middle East, um, Central Asia, and Northern Africa, as well as Indonesia. Um, but you can find it all over the world. And so I'm sure you guys know that there's many uh, Muslim students here on campus. Um, they're in South, or Muslims are in South America, they're in Australia, other areas of North America and Asia um, and Africa. And so it's a worldwide religion. It's not localized like some. Um, but it's primarily in that Northern Africa, Middle East, Central Asia, and Indonesia region. Um, you can see the um, scale over here. That, that's primarily where they are today, but they're all over the world. And so just comparing and contrasting um, Christianity and Islam a little bit, um, Muslims believe that humans are inspired to sin, meaning it's in Allah's will that we all sin at some point in our lives. Um, whereas in Christianity, we're taught that sin is rebellion against God. Um, and so God didn't um, cause us to sin. It was our own rebellious actions that led to us sinning um, and rebelling against God. Um, whereas Islam is believed the opposite. Um, also in Islam, they're uncertain of their salvation. And so um, in order to do, or in order to have the best chance of being saved, they go through the five pillars of Islam, um, practicing those, praying five times a day, doing the Hajj. Um, being generous with their time, their money, um, and everything. But even if they do everything to a T and live a perfect life in the eyes of a Muslim, um, they're still uncertain of their salvation. Um, and the saying, peace be, by, peace be upon him, whenever Muslims mention the name Muhammad or other prophets, is because they don't know if those prophets are actually saved. And so they're trying to intervene and ask Allah to show grace to Muhammad and the other prophets um, in order to... Um, and to try to get them, to try to convince Allah to get them to go to heaven, um, or they consider heaven, heaven paradise. Um, whereas in Christianity, we know that the Bible says if you confess with your mouth, and or if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Um, and so we can be certain of our salvation, but no matter how good of a life you live as a Muslim, you're still uncertain of your final destination. Um, which leads to them doing a lot of good works, and so praying five times a day, um, doing the Hajj, that sort of thing. Um, they are doing those things to try to give themselves the best chance of being saved, um, even though Allah has the final say, and they believe that some people are predestined um, for paradise or hell, um, and you can't change Allah's will, but they attempt to give themselves the best chance of um, receiving a favorable eternal destination. Um, and so their, their faith is um, can be looked at as being works-based, whereas our faith um, is faith-based. And so we know that, like I said, if, if you um, have faith in Christ, then you can be sure of your salvation, um, as it states in the Bible. And then another thing about Islam is that they never really know what Allah's will is. Um, they're always seeking it. They're always trying to interpret Sharia law and live their lives accordingly. Um, whereas in Christianity, we can read the Bible and we can see what God's will is for our lives. He doesn't give us individual details, like he doesn't say, Cody, go to this school, or Sam, take this job. But um, ultimately, we know what um, God's will is for our lives by looking at the New Testament and his commands um, and the way that he wants us to live um, and spread his kingdom here on earth. And so, because um, Islams are uncertain of their salvation and they do works to try to give themselves a favorable eternal destination, um, and they're always seeking Allah's will, they can never truly know what it is, um, there are Muslims that say that they live in fear of um, going to hell, and so they live their lives in a way that tries to give them the best chance of going to heaven. Ultimately, they're doing a lot of what they do in their life out of fear and not out of um, faith or a glad heart. Whereas, um, as Christians, we live in a relationship with Christ. Um, we have joy, we have the other fruits of the Spirit um, that I can name, even though Daniel Gary sometimes can't. Um, those that know to Cal or that go to Calvary know what I'm saying, <laughs> um, or to merge. Um, but yeah, we, we live in a relationship with Christ. 
um, as opposed to living in fear in our lives. Um, and so um, that brings me to some of the complications with Islam from a Christian perspective. Um, the Quran can be looked at as being contradictory because in some passages it says that you receive salvation by doing good works, by upholding, upholding the five pillars of Islam essentially. Um, but in other areas of the Quran it says that no matter what you do, your eternal um, destination is, is set by Allah and you can't change it, you can't um, alter where you're, you're going to be after you die. Um, and so it can be looked at as contradictory. Um, and like the last sli slide said, there's always that unknown or uncertainty factor of your salvation, um, even for the righteous. And so they're, like I said, um, living in fear. They're hopeful, but they're, um, some will say that they have um, a fear deep down that they don't actually know where they're going to be when they die. Um, as well as Allah being unknowable um, in his true nature, and that his will is always going to be a mystery, whereas um, the Bible talks about how we can know Jesus and um, as we read the Bible, we can figure out what God's will is for our lives and for His church here on earth. Um, and then also, um, the idea of bowing down towards Mecca and towards um, the Kaaba can be seen as a form of idolatry, even though they're bowing down um, on paper, it, it's um, read as they're bowing down towards God, but it's easy to, it's a fine line to walk, bowing down towards, towards God or through bowing down towards a city and an actual building. Um, and so it's, it can border on idolatry um, and what they actually worship. And then also in Islam, um, it's believed that everyone goes through hell before the righteous enter paradise. And so even if you are going to go to heaven one day, you enter hell first and spend a, a period of time there before you go to heaven. And so, um, out of all this, <laughs> I will say I do not take credit for this picture. Um, one of you guys did it. I won't say who, but one of you guys made the picture. Um, I'm sure some of you guys can guess. But just my personal understanding. Um, I enjoyed doing this project. I enjoyed learning about Ishmael and Hagar and just um, how the, the roots of Abraham's offspring are intertwined between Christianity, Judaism, and um, Islam, as I did my project on. Um, so I enjoyed learning that history. Um, and I enjoyed learning the views on um, Jesus as a prophet, which I didn't elaborate on too much in this presentation, um, but I elaborated more in my paper. Um, but essentially they view Jesus as a prophet, um, not as the Son of God, and um, not as the Messiah, although they do believe he was born of a virgin, lived a perfect life, and died, and will um, descend from heaven one day. Um, but they don't believe he's the Messiah or the Son of God. Um, and I also had many conversations, some of you guys have met Abbas, um, him and I talked quite a bit at the Creation Museum, um, and afterwards he was a Muslim, but now he considers himself a Christian, and so we had many conversations about um, why he decided to um, walk away from his Islamic faith, even though his family is still um, Muslim um, back home, and just his take on um, the Quran and the Bible and how Islam or Muslims view Jesus versus how Christians view Jesus. Um, and also just I've enjoyed learning about the major pitfalls of um, Islam from a Christian perspective. Now I know that um, if someone that's not Christian just goes and does a bunch of research and has conversations like interviews um, people that are Christians, they're not going to truly understand um, what the Christian faith is. Um, and so I don't claim to truly know what the um, Islamic faith is, because um, I'm not Islam, I don't um, live that life, I don't experience um, it the way that Muslims experience it, and so I'm by no means an expert, this is just a surface level presentation, um, but I've enjoyed learning everything that I talked to you guys about, um, and as Ben said before, next week Danielle's going to be presenting on Scientology, and after that Laura will be presenting on Voodoo. So that's all I have. Um, we'll do a Q&A for questions that I may or may not be able to answer. But thank you guys for being here and for listening to my presentation. Questions? Carol. Okay. Um, so I guess my first question is, what do they believe that Allah's purpose is for people or like in general? Like, do they see him as the creator and do they think that he like made us for nothing? Like, what is, what is his goal? Um, that's a good question. They do view him as, as creator. Um, they view that he created Adam and that all humanity um, came through 
Adam, um, and that all humans are sinful. Um, but I, I couldn't answer um, your question on like what his, his goal or his purpose is in creating life the way that he created it. Um, I don't know if someone else has input that I don't have on that. Maybe Dennis, maybe someone else, no? Okay, yeah, sorry. Okay. My second question kind of goes along with that, but like, do they agree with biblical history up until Abraham? That's also a good question. Um, so, obviously there were differences in Abraham's life and who they think Abraham tried to sacrifice, which son. Um, and so I don't know if they, I don't think they do. I don't, because, I mean, I don't know what the Quran says, honestly. I haven't looked at it or what the interpretations. Um, so I don't know what their, their history is before Abraham. Um, if it's the same, obviously, um, they believe in Adam. Job is one of their prophets. Um, he was around that same time in Genesis. Um, and other like biblical characters, but I don't know if there's um, a lot of parallels or discrepancies between some of the details of the lives of those people that we read about in the Bible. Obviously, there was differences between Ishmael and Isaac um, in their view, and so I'm, I'm sure there's other differences, but I don't know for sure. You would have a hard time <coughs> having getting this, getting them to agree or to see the where they conflict with each other. Um, the, they're encouraged in the Quran to actually have relationships and talk with people in the Bible, the people of the book. Um, so Christians and Jews, they're encouraged to have friendships with them. But as far as recognizing how we see the scriptures versus how they would see it would probably be um, just a, a point of non-conversation. <clears throat> Could you explain like what they believe about prophets a little more? Like what makes someone a prophet, and are they fallible or infallible? So I don't know what exactly the criteria is for being labeled a prophet. Um, they have the twenty-five that they know for sure were prophets, but there were sources that I looked at that said they're maybe up to like a hundred thousand prophets um, in Islam, and so they don't know all of them. They know some of them, and so they look at those twenty-five um, as actual prophets. But I don't know. I don't. I, they, they, they believe Jesus lived a sinful or sin, sinless life, um, which is the only prophet that I saw them comment on about not sinning. So I'm assuming they believe that other prophets in some way, shape, or form sinned at some point, but I don't know exactly. So I apologize. I don't know if maybe someone else knows. If not. Okay, so since a lot of their prophets were from the nation of Israel, what do they believe about the nation of Israel in general? Like, what's their, what's like the view on that? So they believe that Israel came through Ishmael and his descendants, and not Isaac. Oh. Um, which is why they they view they kind of they view Ishmael the way that we view Isaac in okay. a way. Um, not not exactly, you? but yeah. They, so what they do they think about side. Isaac then? They just they view him as a prophet. Um, I I don't know all the about Isaac specifically, but um, they, they think Isaac and then Jacob and Joseph are prophets, um, probably just because they're related to Abraham and by blood, and so, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question at all, but, yeah. Do they affirm, like, the resurrection of Jesus, or just everything in his life up until, like, his death? Good question. I remember reading, okay, so they, they don't believe that he was killed on a cross. Um, they think he just died and went to heaven. I remember reading something about the resurrection, but it was earlier. I don't think they believe he resurrected, but they do think that he's descending from heaven one day. Yeah, they, is that true? They, one is called the swoon theory, where they believe that God kind of swiped and swapped at the same time. And it was actually <laughs> Jesus who died on the cross, not Jesus. Um, but it's but they do believe that Jesus is coming back again. Uh, one imam believes that um, a prophet doesn't receive their final revelation until they turn 40. And so Jesus left the earth at 33, so he's got to come back, live seven years to receive his final revelation. That's one popular imam out of Canada refers, that's how he interprets the end times. But they do believe Jesus is coming back, um, but they don't believe he died on the cross because that would be... Um, disrespectful for a prophet to die that way. Mm -hmm. um, 
So what makes the, the Sunnis and the Shias, like what makes them think that they're right as opposed to the other one? Like where, where did that split come from, I guess? And like why are they like, oh, well it should be this? Yeah, um, again, I, don't, I can't answer that exactly. Um, obviously there was probably a disagreement at some point between two parties. Um, I think like other denominations within Christianity, at some point in history there's a disagreement. Um, half the crowd thinks this, half the crowd thinks that. And so churches split, churches divide, um, denominations are born. And so I'm assuming it's something along those lines. What did they, like do they hold Jesus as different because he lived a sinless life? Or like how did they justify that Jesus lived a sinless life but not all these other, like including Muhammad? Uh huh. Um, good question. So that's, that's one of the reasons that Abbas um, left Islam is because he realized that Jesus lived a sin, sinless life um, and he was born of a virgin and they believe that he's going to descend from heaven one day but they don't, Islam or Muslims don't believe that he's um, the son of God or the Messiah and that just didn't add up to Abbas and he would be, I know you know him better than most people um, in this room but he would be a good person to ask. I don't know um, as a whole what Muslims think but I know that that was one of the reasons that he viewed um, Islam is incorrect and their faith is um, wrong, essentially. Okay. And so that's why he's a Christian now. A lot of Muslims are taught from early age that Jesus is procreated between God the Father and Mary. And so kind of a, a Zeus and Hercules type of relationship. And so they, they struggle with seeing Jesus as, as God because they, they see it He's more of a demigod or some, something of that nature. Okay. And then because we revere him, they're not going to in that same regard. Uh, but he is the one who's talked about the most in the Quran. He's, as Aaron's already said, all, I mean, he's given the accolades, but that point of being that he is God is an affront to their understanding and what they've been taught. And so that's why it's always challenging to go into conversations on the Trinity with Muslims because they how they think we think is challenging. And so it, it, you can still have the good conversations, but knowing that that's, you're going to run into that wall first. Um, do Muslims have a different viewpoint on sin than Christians do? It's the view that all humans are sinful and will sin in some way, shape, or form. And like I said, they view that it's in Allah's will and intention that humans will sin. Um, but I don't know what they view as specific sins. They don't have, I mean, they don't view the Ten Commandments the same way that we do. They don't view other commands in the Bible the same way that we do. Um, I'm sure there's things in the Quran or in Hadith that um, they derive specific sins from. But I, I don't know what they are exactly. It's a lot of the common things, like the same as us, um, like adultery or sexual sin is obviously one of them because they, they pray separately to avoid that temptation. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't tell you specific sins that they hold. So do you have to con like do you have to do all of the five pillars to even be considered for salvation? And like then what if someone was too poor to like afford a pilgrimage? Like are they still considered or that's a really good question and that's that's one of the things that Muslims kind of wrestle with. That's like one of the deeper questions that they face. Um, they, so the, one of the passages in the Quran says that everyone, um, like all of humanity, has a um, predestined eternal resting place, heaven or hell, um, given by Allah. And you can do your best to try to influence what his final decision will be, will be on Judgment Day. I didn't mention that, but they, they believe in a Judgment Day one day. Um, and they, they live a life that tries to influence that decision, but ultimately they can't be certain of their salvation. Um, but they also believe that even if you aren't a Muslim, um, Allah can still show grace to some people that live a, a good life or a life that like met certain standards, um, but there's no way of them knowing what those standards are. Um, and so, I mean, I think there's, it's, it's safe to probably assume that there's people that like physically can't make the pilgrimage to Mecca, um, or they become a Muslim much later in life and they can't afford it, or they're somehow disabled and just like can't do it or can't uphold other um, pillars, but ultimately they don't, they don't know. 
um, what Allah's um, final decision will be, and they don't know um, what their salvation is. They can also contribute to someone else to go as a means of grace through them. <coughs> Questions kind of silly, but like, um, I feel dumb asking this actually. Okay, if they get far enough away from Mecca, how do they know like which direction to pray? Doesn't there come a certain point where it's like we could face this way or the exact opposite way, and it's about the same? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> there's an app for that. Really? There's an app for that. Oh wow. Okay. Cool. There's an app for it. So I've heard, I've heard it's like the literal direction, but I've also heard it's the shortest distance. Um, so like if you like. I mean, just think about flying across the country. You don't fly straight across. You kind of go up and over to like follow the curve of the earth. And so I've, I've viewed that um, they some some will pray in the direction that's the shortest distance between them and the Kaaba, and some pray in the actual like like literal direction of the Kaaba. Um, but that's a good question, and I don't know. So how heavy is like the emphasis on avoiding temptation to sin, but like? compared with the idea that sin is like within Allah's will or whatever. Because like you see some that are very big about like hair coverings and like that type of thing. Is that like a denominational thing? Like Sunni versus Shia or Yeah. Um I feel bad saying I don't know again, but like ultimately I don't know what the answer is. Um I know that um in the Quran a lot of times Muslims are known for like super harsh punishments when people sin. Um, like being stoned, or if you like steal something, which is also a sin, um, they'll like, amputate your hand. Um, most Muslims don't hold that strict interpretation of the Quran, um, but in terms of avoiding temptation, I'm sure there's other things that they're encouraged to do, like men and women not praying together, um, or if you know that like you're in a place that you might be tempted to steal something, I'm sure they're encouraged to avoid that. Um, but ultimately, like the bottom line is not sinning. Um, like I know in Christianity. It's not a sin to be tempted, it's a sin to act on that temptation. And so, they, I'm assuming they hold a similar view to that. Like, being tempted isn't wrong, but acting on that temptation is wrong. Um, but ultimately, like like I said, I'm, I'm not sure exactly. Before I encourage y'all one thing, with Ramadan starting tomorrow, if you want to have an outreach to a Muslim friend on campus,